Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and all of us at Books and Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Julie Marie Wade and Julia Coots to discuss their new books, Just an Ordinary Woman Breathing and The Rib Joint, respectively. You can find both of their books for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make helps keep books and books up and running, so order away. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after their talk. Now I'd like to briefly introduce Julie Marie Wade, who will then intro Julia Coots, and I wanna thank them both for bringing their books to us virtually and for encouraging our literary community to live on in this space. So Julie Marie Wade was born in Seattle in 1979. She went to school for a very long time. At some point she knew she wanted to stay in school forever. So she became a professor. Now she teaches poetry, memoir, lyric essay, and hybrid forms at Florida International University in Miami. She's married to Angie Griffin, and this is her 11th book. So now, without further ado, let me bring Julie to the screen. There you are, Julie. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, um, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we know that this has been um, kind of a, a season of bad news and a weekend of bad news, um, but you are here and uh, we're here and we feel like that's really good news. Um, also, Julia Kutz uh, and I have been planning this reading uh, for a year now. Um, we owe a lot to Books and Books for their tenacity and staying with us. Uh, we had this idea in September, 2019. Um, we thought, you know, we're both lesbian lyric essayists living in Florida uh, who have just written new memoirs, that's kind of a sign like we should be reading together. Um, and so we we talked to the folks at Books and Books and we set up this event and we thought we would all be um, in Coral Gables in March of 2020. And um, as you know, that didn't happen. And so we thought maybe maybe in six months we can be together. Um, and that almost didn't happen, right? Except that Books and Books saved us and gave us a virtual space. And so, um, so we can at least be together this way. Um, and we don't wanna wait anymore. We're excited. Um, we're so glad that you're here. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing Julia, um, who's going to read first first, and then um, I will read after her. Um, and then, as Christina said, there will be um, some time for a question. So um, without further ado, uh, Julia Coots is the author of The Rib Joint, a memoir and essays, which looks like this, um, and which I had the pleasure of blurbing. Um, her book was published in 2019 by Red Hen Press. Her forthcoming poetry collection, which comes out next year, is called Pine um, from Southern Indiana Review Press. And her previous poetry collection is Hold Like from the University of South Carolina Press. She is the winner of the 2017 Red Hen Press Nonfiction Book Award, judged by Mark Doty, the 2019 Michael Waters Poetry Book Prize, and the 2011 South Carolina Poetry Book Prize, judged by National Book Award winner Nikki Finney. Julia's essays and poems have been published or are forthcoming in literary journals, including Creative Nonfiction, Indiana Review, Nimrod, The Los Angeles Review, Carolina Quarterly, and Portland Review. She earned her MFA at the University of South Carolina and her PhD in creative writing and literature at the University of Cincinnati. She is now an assistant professor of creative nonfiction at the University of South Florida in Tampa. So without any more ado, Julia Coots. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you, Christina and Books and Books for hosting this event. And thank you all for, for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna read a chapter, it's about from the middle of, of the rib joint. It's titled, How to Ignite. Um, there's a, an epigraph by Sappho. My tongue is broken, thin flame runs under my skin. In seventh grade, I got a crush on the priest's daughter. I didn't call it a crush at the time. For a middle school girl in the South or maybe anywhere in 1995, having a crush on another girl seemed impossible. 
a thing for which I didn't have a name. Crush, the boy with blonde shoulder length hair at the neighborhood pool. Crush, the orange, the cold orange soda my friends and I drank after school in the unfinished room above her parents' garage. Our tongues turning the orange of 70s shag carpet. Crush, the way my babysitter pressed the hot tip of her cigarette out against the metal ashtray of her wood paneled station wagon. Elizabeth's family moved to town the summer before I started seventh grade. After my best friend's dad, the previous priest, received a call to another church in another state. I grew up in the church, the way some people grow up in a neighborhood. Before my best friend moved away, we both lived in the older part of town within walking distance of seven churches. Unlike other kids at school who lived in subdivisions, with cul-de-sacs, track housing, and gates at the entrances, my best friend and I walked through churchyards to find each other. We rode our bikes through graveyards, played basketball at the hoop behind the parish hall, started games of hide and seek in the Sunday school rooms. Every Wednesday afternoon, we walked to choir practice. During certain liturgical seasons like Lent, we ate supper at church too. We knew every hymn, every prayer, every place to hide. We knew every mystery too, like the passion, the story of Jesus's last days on earth and his suffering on the cross. Passion from the old Occitane word, passio, meaning violent love. That's the way it hit me when I first saw Elizabeth in the green hallway on my way to French class and the trailers behind the eighth grade classrooms. Violent love as in distorting, the fluorescent lights humming above us in plastic panels. As in, I didn't see anyone else against the long wall of green lockers. As in, strong, an ocean wave, our school's mascot, the kids pushing their way through the halls. As in, impatient, the teacher standing in the doorway, the hall bell about to ring above us. Elizabeth was a year older than me, and in middle school, a year seemed like a particularly long time. I thought that by eighth grade, girls had learned things about love that all seventh grade girls didn't know yet. A few months into our friendship, Elizabeth taught me how to break up with a boy. If you don't like him, she, you should just tell him, she told me, as if what I wanted was as simple as saying the words. I'll show you, she said. We sat cross-legged on her carpeted bedroom floor. She called my boyfriend, Paul, and pretended to be me. When he answered, she motioned for me to move closer so I could hear. I don't want to go out anymore, she told Paul. I could smell her hair, blonde and shoulder length, parted down the middle. It smelled good, clean. I looked at her hands around the receiver, her nails short and bitten, something we shared something we'd notice about each other when we'd first met. Twirling the phone card around her finger as she talked, Elizabeth made breaking up sound easy. The first time I spent the night at Elizabeth's house, we went to the grocery store with her mom before dinner. In the produce department, Elizabeth picked up a pomegranate, a fruit I'd never seen before. In her hand, it looked like an apple, but where a stem would be, a spiked opening appeared a hardened flower without stamen or pistol. They're so good, she said, you eat the seeds, I'll show you. When we got back to her house, her mom cut off the unfamiliar fruit spiked top on their kitchen counter, scored it into six sections and pulled it apart, revealing what looked like hundreds of little red beads, enough to make a necklace. Try one, Elizabeth said, handing me a small red seed that she'd pulled from the pith to eat. The seed was delicate, thin, and when I put it in my mouth, easily broken. The knife her mom had used dripped pink. Pomegranate from the Latin pomum and granitum. Seeded apple, fatal fruit, food of the dead, seed of the imprisoned, keeper of Persephone. In German, granada an explosive shell used in warfare. On one of the first really warm days of spring, I was an acolyte at an outdoor service. After processing up the grass aisle, carrying the tall brass cross, 
I took my seat next to the priest, Elizabeth's dad. The bright gray headstones glimmered with sun. Elizabeth and several other eighth graders sat in the front row in squeaky metal folding chairs. The azalea bushes bloomed bright pink and all the girls wore sundresses. I don't know what came over me. Maybe I overheated from wearing a long white robe over my dress. Maybe my serotonin levels shot up too quickly. My brain forgetting how to handle so much sun after months of gray winter days. Or perhaps I went back in time when passion was a verb from the old French passionnaire and the German passion to torment, to torture, to want to the point of grief. We might have been singing, come thou fount of every blessing or light the fire or purify my heart. Whichever song the organist played on his portable keyboard set up in the grass made me feel suddenly ignitable. O oh, Eros, O oh, thin flame, O oh, melter of our limbs, my body felt liquid, like there wasn't a single bone inside. Without thinking of the consequences, during the last hymn I mouthed, I love you to Elizabeth. Still in my white acolobe robe, I walk straight up to Elizabeth after the service. Trying to remember the way she'd broken up with Paul for me on the phone months before. Juice. I didn't for her to say the phrase back to me. For her to feel how she pushed her tongue off the back of her mouth. Hang on, everyone. She's coming back. She's coming back. I think it has to do with her connectivity, but I've re-invited her. There you are, Julia. I'm sorry. Do you want to just like take it from where, where you left off? Sure. OK, hang on. Or I can just start. Hmm. Looks like your video is a little bit delayed. Can you hear me? Julia? I can hear you. Okay, then try it. I can let's hear you. It. Okay, let's try it. Okay. My pink tin speed bike to a restaurant on the old town square to meet we all ordered chicken fingers and fries which the waitress brought to us so i was a whole year younger after lunch we rode our bikes to jane's house to find her parents cigarettes our bike tires kicked up the gravel Some of the girls opened a window in the upstairs bathroom and smoked in the shower. I waited until we rode our bikes to Azalea Park, the same place where I'd first kissed a boy the year before. Standing on the grass in the circle of girls, I took a few puffs of the cigarette we passed around to share. After leaving the park, we rode to Holly's house, a few blocks from church. I had about an hour before junior high youth group started. The eighth grade girls were moving up to the senior high youth group that week, so they didn't have to be at church until dinner. Holly thought her mom wouldn't notice if we took a little pour of liquor from each bottle in their cabinet. That way all the bottles will look the same, she said. In a plastic cup, she poured a little vodka, a little gin, a little tequila. As we walked down the empty road from Holly's house, also communion. Came 
to ask the rest of us if we knew that lighter to burn a smiley face onto your skin. Surprising myself at how quickly do it or if she volunteered. Regardless, the only way I was going to let someone burn me was if she was the one doing the burning. There was something comforting in knowing I'd share the hurt with her. Elizabeth and I had started taking guitar lessons from a parishioner at church a few months earlier. I thought about the way the tips of our fingers hurt and sometimes bled after practice. I thought about the way we compared the calluses on our fingertips. How when we peeled off the hardened skin like the rind of a fruit, the skin underneath was pink and tender. I sat down on one of the brick steps of the church and pushed up my shirt sleeve before I could change my mind. Elizabeth sat down beside me while the other girls circled around us. One of the girls pulled a lighter out of her jeans pocket and handed it to Elizabeth. Are you sure about this? Elizabeth asked me. Yes. Elizabeth pulled her thumb across the serrated spark wheel of the lighter several times until a flame flicked and stayed. Hold the lighter upside down until the top of it gets really hot, one of the girls instructed her. Are you okay, Elizabeth asked me, insistent in her concern. I'm fine, I said, the liquor still warm on my breath. Elizabeth moved her hand closer until she finally touched the hot metal top of the lighter to my upper arm, halfway between my elbow and my shoulder. Without thinking, I yelled and pulled away from her. The burn felt deep and permanent, but all that appeared on my skin seconds later was a faint pink curve. The lighter wasn't on my skin long enough to make the eyes or the full curve of the mouth. The mark looked indifferent, I thought, nothing like a smile. Do it again, I told Elizabeth. I won't move this time. The girls looked on in anticipation, the way people circle around a bonfire, a prim primordial fascination with things on fire. Elizabeth ran her thumb across the little metal gears to get the lighter hot again. When she moved closer to me on the steps, I tried not to flinch. I wanted desperately to forget the way the, hot, the metal of the lighter had eaten at my skin minutes before how my skin had seemed to melt like wax under the heat. As much as I tried not to think about it, though, I couldn't stop myself, and I pulled away from her a second time when she touched the lighter to my arm. Another faint curve appeared on my skin, an inch above the other one. This time, don't let me pull away, I told Elizabeth, determined to make it work. Are you sure, she asked, looking at the two other burns. Yes, I said, with a surety I rarely had when answering questions. This time, the third time, I wanted to get it right. She held my wrist with one hand and pushed the lighter into my upper arm and her other hand until I pulled away from her for good, sure that the metal had burned down to the muscle this time, singeing it black. There, it worked, I said, smiling when I looked down at the eyes and perfect mouth that had begun to pucker on my arm. The failed attempts look delicate, already starting to blister. Two necklaces to accentuate the bright face that smiled inches above them on my arm. As I walked alone into the air-conditioned cool of the dimly lit parish hall for junior high youth group, leaving Elizabeth and the other eighth grade girls behind me in the sun, I didn't know then how I would have to hide the burns from my parents how the third burn, the worst burn, would get badly infected a few weeks later, how I would lie to my mom, insisting the burn was from a curling iron I'd used at a sleepover, how the eighth grade girls would start high school so soon, how Elizabeth and I would grow apart, how a few years later, the two smaller scars on my arm would completely disappear, how the worst burn wouldn't ever heal correctly, the scar still visible on my arm 21 years later. A pool, a ripple, the scar from the burn catching light like water. Burn, a noun in Old English meaning a stream or river. Because I prayed this word I want, Sappho wrote, I asked a girl for a river, a burn to mark the fire I could not speak. Thank you. Bravo, bravo, and thank you for sticking with us and coming back.
Let me get Julie. I stayed on the screen because it seemed to stabilize the, the image. Good. So that was riveting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, I also will be reading from um, a building's roman, a coming of age narrative. Um, Can you hear Julia. me okay? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Julia, I'm going to X you out and reprompt you, and we'll okay. let we'll let Julie read while we do that. Okay. 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 Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I'm not sure if, if I spoke anything anyone could hear before, but um, but like Julia's book, um, I'm also reading from um, a lyric building's roman or um, a formation story, coming of age story. Um, mine is arranged into five uh, really long chapters. So I'm going to read um, three shorter sections from part two. Um, and the only thing that you need to know is that um, I am in real life an only child. And so when you hear uh, references to siblings in this section, one thing um, that you would know if you had read the whole section is that um, the siblings are imaginary, um, the adults are not. So to begin, the truth is in the teeth, the dentist claims. He is tall and tapered like a candle. He wears a green mask over his mouth. They are the longest lasting feature of our species, he says. They carry the body secrets. I thought that was the tongue. Now he lets out a hearty laugh. The mass crinkles around his lips. I commit to memory the contents of his window ledge. Aloe plant, abalone shell, driftwood. You're an intriguing little girl. He states it like a fact, not a compliment. He seems like a prophet to me a man who should be standing on a mountaintop. Thank you, I say. My mother has taught me nothing if not good manners. As he cleans my teeth, Dr. Watts describes the mouth like a magic kingdom. He is in love with his profession, the way some men love their wives and children, the way prophets love the word of God. Did you know that paleontologists use teeth to identify fossils? From teeth, they can tell what the creature was, what it ate, who its family members were. He holds the little mirror on the silver stem inside my mouth. In the next room, I hear my mother chatting with the receptionist. I practice my best concentration, the dial in my mind turning her loud voice down. I hear you're the finest speller in first grade, he says. Can you spell teeth? I nod. Gums? I nod again. What about enamel? I think on it, then nod again. Well, that's very good. Dr. Watts wipes his utensils and offers me a sip of water. Do you think you could spell deciduous? I have never heard this word before. It comes over me like a wave, successive splashes of yellow and green. What does it mean, I ask? Something temporary, like leaves on a tree like your first set of teeth. I have lost one tooth already and another is loose. These are your deciduous teeth, he tells me, but your permanent teeth are on their way. My tongue moves to the new space at the front of my mouth where the air rushes in when I try to whistle. Do you know the tooth fairy, I ask him. It is almost time for my mother with her dark pink lips and full set of permanent teeth to take my place in this chair. You mean personally? I nod. Well, I think I've bumped into him at a conference or two. Someone may have introduced us once. The tooth fairy is a man? This possibility has not occurred to me before. I thought fairy was a girl word, like princess or ballerina. Dr. Watts, guilty for revealing a secret that only the teeth should know, looks away and pretends to be interested in my x-rays. Well, it was a long time ago, he says. I could have been mistaken. It's okay, I reassure him. I won't tell anyone. But I like the idea that I am privy to this truth, 
like the truth of angels who are always glowing women on the Christmas tree, but seem to be only glowing men in the Bible. We're all done here, he smiles, his mask removed. You have strong, happy teeth, young lady. Let's make sure they stay that way. You are seven years old and coming into your calling. For you, the truth is in the words you study in the dictionary under pretense of learning their forms. Yes, it delights you. The surprise of the P in receipt, the double L at the conclusion of quill. You are interested in their relationships, how the quill might be used to write the receipt in a careful cursive you haven't learned yet. But there is also the texture of the words, their glint in the light, their cadence as they fall upon the ear. While your mother quizzes you at the kitchen table, you consider the bodies of words, their relative beauties. You consider their heft and height and the other words contained within them. Heat inside sheath, evil inside devil. Words you marvel are like nesting dolls able to stand apart and also to fit together. For Thanksgiving, we travel. We become like pilgrims, P-I-L-G-R-I-M-S, with my father at the helm and my grandmother beside him. She like the quill, he like the receipt she has written. My mother and I squeeze our knees close in the upholstered back seat of the company car. Together we spell and sing and stare off into the distance. Aunt Linda is our destination. Soon we will see her where she lives alone in a one bedroom apartment. Not a wife yet and not a homeowner either. Do you have to be married to have a house? But I have been chided for asking about marriage before, as in the last year when I was six and still simple minded, and I studied the ring on her right middle finger. Is that your wedding ring? Why do you wear it there on the wrong hand? Aunt Linda may be sensitive about that fact, my father said. It is better to ask people about what they have than about what they are lacking. Aunt Linda has my mother's name. Both their mothers christened them Linda, and since my mother married my father, and since my aunt is still a tenant and not a wife, they both sign their checks Linda Wade, though the script is different, just as the letter that comes between Linda M, my mother, Linda A, my aunt. If my father calls out in a room, both women will turn and answer. This fact surprises me also that there aren't enough names for everyone to have their own. Aunt Linda wears an apron dusted with flour, beneath it a mauve, M-A-U-V-E, sweater and white winter slacks. She hugs us each like we might break and then we scatter, which is close to shatter, but not quite. Scatter is a movement word. Shatter refers to glass. Mama, I've got a nice hot cup of coffee for you, Aunt Linda says, leading my grandmother to an oversized chair. My father hangs up his hat and sets to work sliding the leaf into the dining room table. In the kitchen, my mother dons an apron, adjusts the station on the radio. When I perch on the stool at the pass-through window, two Lindas mash potatoes side by side. Two Lindas arrange hors d'oeuvres, spelling unknown without speaking. Aunt Linda, I was wondering. On my bookshelf, she smiles, pleased with her psychic powers. I bolt down the hallway and into a room. There are bells on the doorknob that jingle as I enter. These are not just for Christmas, but for all year round. Breathless, I spin until my eyes fix on the brightly colored nesting doll, also called a Russian doll and another word that starts with M that I can't pronounce yet. My joy is like gratitude, my heart like the horn of plenty. I kneel on the carpet and begin to unnest them. This is how it is to be human, to have more than one person inside you. First, I thought it was the years of life, like the little one-year-old inside the slightly bigger two-year-old, the simple-minded six-year-old inside the complex-minded seven-year-old. But now I know otherwise. As I pair each doll body with its doll head, I think about the me that is bad at dancing and the me that is good at spelling and the me the teacher thinks is quiet, 
Even though I am full to brimming with words she has never asked me to say. I think also about the me my father loves to take to the park. The me my grandmother says reminds her of her dead husband. The me my mother so often finds disappointing. I was not born with natural curly hair. I have dimples, true, but two left feet. Despite the best lessons and home permanence, I will never be a Shirley Temple. I lay the dolls out and line them up on the bed. I like to admire them just as they are, nameless, with faces that never change. The same cannot be said for the rest of us. On the nightstand, a younger version of my grandmother stands beside a younger version of my Aunt Linda. It is the mother-daughter tea at Linda's sorority, S-O-R-O-R-I-T-Y, -O -O a place where girls go to become beautiful in college. Aunt Linda has pale gold hair that slants across her cheeks and pale thin arms she never shows now, even in the heat of summer. Grandma June has dark hair spun high like a layer cape and wears a soft pink corsage pinned to the breast of her suit. I wouldn't know it was them if I hadn't been told. When my father summons me to the table, I am still sitting here on my knees. I turn to him, hesitant at the door frame, and all I can think to say is, why does Aunt Linda still sleep in a little girl's bed? There's the wicker headboard, the flowered quilt, the narrow width for only one body. It is like my bed or the bed borrowed by Goldilocks. I glance again at her pale gold hair. My father shakes his head, but doesn't answer. Your mouth is always full of words, but sometimes they are hidden. Your teeth like trees in a forest of unsayable things. There are many ways to imagine it. The teeth are trees, or they are wood pilings in the water. Your mouth the harbor where words come to rest and wait. The words are boats, like the kind you watch from your kitchen window. There are sailboats, which are light and breezy with bright colored sails, the colors of Matryoshka dolls. There are freighters too, big ships that are pulled along by small ships the way your father is pulled along by your mother. These ships are called tugs, named for what they do. You have never seen a cruise ship, but your Aunt Linda has traveled on a floating hotel all the way to Alaska and back again. Your great Aunt Ruth comes from Canada by ship, a large ferry with a special name, the Victoria Clipper. Other words come to mind, other words you are storing in your harbor mouth, skiff, Yacht, catamaran, the last one gleams red and gold. I sit with Kelly in the best tree in our grandmother's backyard. We like to pretend we are Mary Lennox and Dickon looking over the wall into the secret garden. Sometimes we climb down and pick rhubarb, R-H-U-B-A-R-B, which grows red and wild in the untended flower beds. We rinse it with the hose, being older now and a little afraid of the dirt. Then we move higher into the rockery, just out of view, where the next neighbor's gate is wrapped with a chain, cinched with a padlock. This is where we like to pause, tugging the rhubarb between our teeth, sometimes sweet, but mostly sour, and play our private game. I have hidden my best treasure here, wedged between the rocks. It is something I found in an old box belonging to our mother. The keychain is a huge red plastic heart with the word love printed in tall white letters. Attached are no fewer than 50 keys. Most of them are ordinary to look at, gold or gray with tiny teeth made to fit some furtive lock. But one is blue as a peacock feather, smaller than all the others and many times more beguiling, B-E-G-U-I-L-I-N-G. I have already tried it in every lock I can think of, including the padlock that beckons over my shoulder. There wouldn't be a key without a lock, would there? They must make the lock first and then the way to get inside. You're a good sleuth, Kelly tells me. Someday you'll find the door for every key. It's more than doors, though. There are boxes with locks, even diaries. 
Sure, she agrees, but things tend to look like what they are. You can tell a car key from a house key after all, and diaries have the smallest keys. So if you were being interrogated, say, you could swallow that key and never have to open the book where your biggest secrets are stored. Kelly has a point there. Many sleuths before me have had to make bold moves in sticky situations. They have had to hold their tongues when it mattered most, to practice silence like a dance or a tricky piano piece, silence like a concerto, C-O-N-C-E-R-T-O -E by Grieg. Can you imagine if I died, I say, and the doctor took an x-ray, and there in my belly the size of a bone, he found one of those long, elegant skeleton keys. Kelly smiles at me. She can picture it, too. Unlike most people we know, she appreciates the way death and beauty sometimes go together. This is no one's fault. It's just something that happens that no one likes to say. My turn, Kelly whispers, dislodging the hourglass she has pilfered from trivial pursuit. Same rules as always, you have till the sand runs out to reveal a secret or announce a new mystery. Isn't a secret sometimes a mystery? And isn't a mystery almost always a secret? Well, I say softly, wondering how the words will sound when I speak them aloud. This is a secret, I guess. I've never told anyone else. Kelly leans forward, looking like the gymnastic, G-Y-M-N-A-S-T-I-C, orphan with the long side braids in the movie we love called Annie. You know our sister Kristen, the one with the red hair? I know her. Of course I know her. We invented her. Kelly conveys a phrase our father often murmurs, something about two different people being cut from the same cloth. Well, I think I love her, I say. You should, she's your sister. No, I think about her more than the others. I think about her the way you think about Todd Lucas at school. Kelly adores this blonde haired boy, his baseball cap and tight blue jeans. The way his last name is also a first name. Now for the first time since I've known, created her, my sister is silent. She wears an expression like she has just swallowed a key, the bad taste of metal in her mouth. At night, I tell her, when you're sleeping, I sometimes wander over to Kristen's room. She's usually just sitting there at the vanity, brushing her hair. I think she's perfect, like a model, but way more interesting. I can't help it. She's like Christmas, that red hair and those bright green eyes. This doesn't make any sense, Kelly says, blinking hard. I know, I say, it doesn't. So maybe my secret is partly a mystery too. Your diary doesn't have a lock. One day, far in the future, your mother will discover it and she will instruct you to make it disappear. She will find herself scandalized by the content. She will tell you that everything you have written cast the whole family in a negative light. But long before this happens, you will become adept at tearing certain pages out. It is enough to write the words themselves, bold in your new cursive, to press your pencil tip into the white spaces between the neat blue lines, to see what you are most longing to say. There are many pages devoted to Anne Ranking, the dancer who played Grace Farrell in Annie. You love the part where Daddy Warbucks, who loves her the way you do and is not her father, tells her that her teeth are crooked. She offers to have them fixed, but he tells her he likes them crooked. This is a sad truth for you to face. The fact that your own teeth are as straight as the pickets on fences, that the dentist tells you time after time that you will never need braces. In your mind, it is the same as saying, you will never be loved. Thank you. Bravo. Let's give Julia a minute to get back on. Here we go. Can you hear us, Julia? I can. Can you oh, hear me? Okay? Yeah. Excellent. All right, then go for it. Uh, does anybody have any questions for us? Christina, will we be able to see the questions? Are they in the chat? 
Well, since we have the chat on, some people may ask in the chat and some people may ask in the ask a question button. So I wow. think they were just, I think you have to give them a chance because okay. they were, you know, listening very intently. <laughs> so now they have to come up with some questions. Um, so maybe you guys want to talk a little bit and, um, and then we'll see if we can gather a few of those. Well, I can ask Julia a question. I have a question for you. Um, as, as a fellow um, poet who turned uh, also to creative nonfiction, um, I'm wondering, um, did you always know that you were interested in writing memoir, writing lyric essay, um, or how do you see that relationship between the poetry and the prose? Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't start writing nonfiction until during my PhD program. I was taking some workshops um, in nonfiction. Um, and I think so I was taking it from um, my professor, who is also a poet and essayist. I think that sort of impacted like my coming to the genre in that way of thinking about um, her sort of um, taking a look at language. And I was interested in how, you know, um, the prose sort of allowed me to, you know, ask questions and expand and you know, think about the narrative um, in ways that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not doing in the poetry. I think like I think about the, the lyric um, space of the poem as a sort of small contained space and, and going, you know, in the prose sort of expanding on that. Um, and so I definitely see them as linked. I think that for me, nonfiction um, is a space where we're just talking to my graduate students about the this um, on Thursday with the lyric essay, um, thinking about how it you know invites fragmentation, invites you know thinking about how memory is fragmented, um, you know where are these silences and gaps in time, um, and so that was something that really pulled me to the genre of nonfiction. Me too. <laughs> um, for you, Julie, I was wondering, you know that thinking about the image of the, the teeth, sort of where did that come in when you were you were in the writing process? I love that that image. Um, was that something that you came up with earlier or was you were writing the um, that particular chapter? Well, there's a little anecdote that I maybe would have told if we were in person and I just, I kind of forgot to say it, but um, right before I moved to Florida, um, this is the first book that I, that I worked on um, as I moved here, but um, I was finishing my dissertation also, and I was kind of at that transition point, like where your dissertation is done and you're sort of hungry for your next project. And um, as you know, right, sometimes you're teaching, and I have been teaching for six years in um, women and gender and sexuality studies, um, all kinds of, you know, um, kind of cultural studies classes. Um, and this book came for me that was, um, I think, presuming that I would continue to teach those classes. So it was uh, maybe you'd like to teach from this book, and it was called The Body Reader. And I just love that title. Um, and it was a collection of critical theoretical essays meant to be taught in a kind of like an introduction to feminist studies or embodiment studies class. Um, and I never had a chance to teach from that book, but it kind of it planted the seed for me that I wanted to think more closely about the body, like actual embodiment through, um, well, I guess what I always say to my students is the smallest door. Like, you know, how do we get into something? We have to go through um, a really small door sometimes to, um, to ground us. And and I thought a lot about how oddly teeth played such a big part in my life and this this sort of odd obsession I had with always wanting braces or a retainer or um, headgear, like things nobody else seemed to want when they had them, but things that I felt left out of something that seemed like um, that was part of something that made me different that I didn't have it. And so um, for that chapter, that was a way um, I thought, well, I'll just see what I have to say about teeth, what I remember about teeth. And all of a sudden, you know, it was so many things about teeth. So um, so it was my small door <laughs> in my body reader. Um, oh, wait, there's a question from, hi, Richard, from Richard Blanco. Um, does poetry have to come first for both of you before the nonfiction? Um, what would you say, Julia? Um, I'm interested in sort of, I guess, for me, what that question means, you know, in terms of, um, you know, in the piece, I do think that when I'm writing essays, I am, I do sort of, there's like an image or something that comes to me that I'm kind of working over, um, mm -hmm. which is a similar way in which I, I'm coming to, in when I'm writing poems, that I think that in some ways, I'm coming at them because there's something that I find that I can't understand fully or that I'm, I'm wanting to explore further. Um, and so 
in a way, like you just said, these sort of small doors, I think is a good way of thinking about something as like a poetic or like a lyric moment where there's a sort of constrained, um, you know, moment in time, I guess. Um, so I don't know that I would say that that comes first, or maybe it's a um, like lyric um, inclination or something that comes first, um, which I, I think for me in my, in my writing um, is probably what it is um, that is coming first. I love lyric inclination. Um, I want to. I want to borrow that. Um, I guess. I mean, one thing I always say that's that's odd about myself, but but nonetheless true, is that I always felt like I was a poet. Like I just said that to people from an early age. Like I'm a poet, but also a detective, um, and all these other things. But like I felt that I was a poet. Um, but I really didn't write pro, uh, poems as a kid. I wrote mostly prose. And so I almost kind of connect poetry as in that way, maybe, yes, it's a first because it's like how I thought about, I guess I kind of thought of poets as like, that's the space where you go to, to um, have the deep thought, but then you have to, you have to find a way to communicate it, which is often through the image. But I, I didn't have any of that training initially. So it felt like um, poetry was the state of mind and prose was like the only thing I knew you could really do. I guess I, I knew poetry was like on cards, like greeting cards, but I didn't really have any contact with poetry until college. And so it took a long time for me to actually have a, like a poetry practice, even though I was going around, you know, saying I was a poet all the time, but mostly just um, writing a lot of um, bad novels um, and then getting to college and getting some, some class guidance in, in mostly actually creative nonfiction first. So um, that's a good question. And I too have a lyric inclination. Mm -hmm. I think I think we're on the same page that way. Um, oh, this is Deborah Dean, another of my colleagues who we would have met in real life too. Um, I wonder if you both would like to recommend additional lyrical essay titles, um, a piece that blew you away when you were coming to the genre. Ooh, good question. I think Maggie Nelson's Bluets was one for me. I think that really um, the way in which she is making the, these leaps and there are the silences in between where uh, we, again, have talked about this in my um, graduate nonfiction workshop last semester was like the way in which these silences like allow you as a reader, you're, you're kind of filling in those gaps. You're, um, you know, reading between those spaces. Um, and just that invitation to think too about the idea. We talked about this in my class this last week, the idea as, as a character, um, how, you know, how are you developing your ideas um, so yes. that they are, you know, we think about place as a character oftentimes it's talked about, but also the idea, how is that so important when we're writing essays and we're thinking about um, the possibility of, you know, questioning in the essay. I love Maggie Nelson's Bluets. I know a lot of um, some of my students who are in the audience, uh, some of my grad students have read Bluets. Um, and Maggie Nelson is just a wonder. Um, all of the you know hybrid work and lyric essay and poetry and just like um, just a prodigious canon of her own, which I love. Um, I also um, Deborah. I in the graduate lyric essay class, I often use. Um, the next American essay, which is an anthology by John Degada that has 30 lyric essays, and they kind of even predate, in fact, they mostly predate, I think they go from 1974 to 2003. So they predate um, in the first part of the book, even the use, the widespread use of the term lyric essay. Um, so he has like Joan Didion's uh, The White Album title essay, right? He considers that a lyric essay. So lots of like proto lyric essays. Um, and then the final essay in that book is uh, Jenny Bully's The Body. Uh, it's an abbreviated version of the like novella length, um, The Body. So Jenny Bully has been a big touchstone for me. And also, of course, Maggie Nelson and um, Claudia Rankin's um, both of her uh, projects that are subtitled in American Lyric, uh, Don't Let Me Be Lonely in American Lyric, just um, in terms of blowing me away. That blew me away. Um, that was a 2004 book. And then 10 years later, Citizen in American Lyric. And now um, I'm awaiting my copy of Just Us, an American Conversation. So other other writers who do like poetry and essay um, often, especially ring my chimes. Julie, it looks like like you have some questions in the ask a question button. Oh, so, am I, I'm so sorry. Can yeah. I see? I, oh, so I you might want to check those oh, out oh. too. There it is. Um, I didn't know. So, oh, there's one. Can you see it, Julia? Um, um, what's the, it, this is Julia. What's it like to publish such a rad, all caps, nonfiction book and very queer and to live in the South? <laughs> um, hi, Jillian. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I was, I, that was something that I felt sort of, 
anxious about and thinking about the, the publication, not so much, I think, in the writing of it. Um, I, I wasn't thinking um, as much, okay, what happens after, you know, this, this gets published? Um, I was thinking about it, but it not in a way that I was sort of like thinking about it, worrying about it. Um, so I think that, um, I don't know, I think growing up in the South, um, I was thinking about this. So I taught at Clemson before um, I was teaching at USF, and I was just sort of blown away by the way that students um, in creative writing classes were like talking about queerness so openly in ways that when I was in college, it just wasn't happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's like not that much time that has gone by where, where I think there's we've seen a lot of shifts, um, you know, in our culture and I think in the South, too. And um, and so that was something for me that was really um, like great to see and to experience and see like, okay, it seems that these students are, there seems like less fear. And I'm not saying there isn't any fear there, but I think that I, that we have seen like a shift. Um, and so I think part of it too is, was me thinking about like, what were the stories that like, I wish that I had heard like, um, you know, in middle school, high school, things that maybe would have allowed me to see sort of different possibilities or, um, you know, things that could have been. Um, and so part of in writing this was thinking about, um, you know, who are these other like queer people in the South um, and uh, what kind of stories were they they telling or maybe were afraid to tell, um, you know, as kids. Oh, I think there are more questions too. So sorry, when I pull up the questions, I can't see you, Julia. Um, but this question, oh, it's French and uh, You read things that relate to your childhood and adolescence. Um, as you are writing about your life, how do you decide the right time to talk about a particular time in your life? Um, wow, that's a really good question. Um, well, I can say, um, hi, Jim Ursus. Um, I can say for me that um, the, the thing about the lyric essay that's kind of surprising is it does have, um, like even though it has that recursive energy where you're often circling around something and circling around something and it's actually sometimes a little bit kaleidoscopic, like you keep turning and turning to try to get a different view or a closer view or um, some new way of understanding like a persistent memory or um, a pattern in your own experience. Um, but for all the recursion that happens um, when I work in the lyric essay, I also find that it helps me to often to structure a project where in, in the larger arc of the project, it is chronological um, and then within essays or chapters or smaller parts, there is, you know, leaping forward and leaping back in time um, thematically, but that it's kind of anchored. Um, so I can say for me with this project, um, I, I was trying to get like a closer read, like to do that body reader um, on parts of the past that, you know, maybe have come up tangentially in other things I've written, but some of the things I've been more reticent to write, um, like the imaginary family, some things that I thought maybe couldn't be there for some reason that they were too um, like too interior and I decided to bring them in. And so um, I did decide to write the book largely chronologically so that each of the five sections would move forward um, until I ended up in adulthood. So sometimes chronology really um, helps. It's always been there, but um, lyric essays, some lyric essays sometimes forget that we can also use chronology too. Um, this is like a question I think that comes up oftentimes um, in, in class too, like, is it too early to write about this? Um, and something, um, so I was teaching high school students, this was a few years ago, and I had a student who, she was like recording conversations she had with her grandmother. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I wish I had had the foresight to like, you know, be, be doing that. Um, and so I think like, even if you're working with things like earlier when things are initially happening, like do, you know, do that, record those things, write down what you're thinking. Um, and even if it's not like you're ready to have the, the finalized like version of what that piece is going to be, I think like recording the, those moments and those experiences so that you have this material that you're you know going off of. I think which I think is particularly important in nonfiction. Of um, oftentimes I, I feel people are well, how do I access that memory from so long ago? And I think um, if you're writing about it right after it's happening, you're able to access that um but i think too like sometimes it shifts like you realize in the moment of writing it oh actually i don't think i'm quite ready to go deeper into this experience and i need to put this away for a little bit which i think is like a good thing to be able to recognize um you know as you're working on a project actually i think this needs a little bit more time i need a little bit more space from this to be able to actually write myself as a character um, you know in this essay because it's it's a hard thing to do to both be very open 
but also be able to say, this isn't, you know, I'm not going to collapse into this, um, you know, particularly, I think, oftentimes, if we're writing about things that have been traumatic, um, or difficult, um, that giving yourself some of that space, to, if you need to. Yeah. Um, the other question I saw um, in the ask a question box um, is, is from another student of mine, former student, uh, Raina. Um, she wanted to know um, what, when um, our earliest memories were, um, which I thought was a really good question. And I can I can tell you, Raina, that um, I have incredibly, all of my memories start, seem to start, um, and I think maybe this is significant, uh, with my first day of preschool um, when I was three. Like, I can remember everything. Um, I mean, well, obviously not everything. We lose things. But um, I feel like, like a light switched on as soon as I entered school, um, where I just, um, and then very shortly thereafter, um, I was like learning to read really young and being able to write really young. So I was able to start making um, notes and keeping a journal um, very young. And so I feel like everything from the time I was first starting that first class, um, it just it was like, oh, this is a place where we go to work on the very things that I want to work on. Like this is language arts all the time, reading, writing, like, um, you know, bringing things to life on the page. Um, so my first memories are um, 1982 on and they, they seem very vivid um, since that time. Yeah, I think about this a lot. My, one of my nephews is five and I'm just thinking, okay, like, this, is he going to remember, you know, these things from earlier? It seems like he would. They seem significant. He seemed, you know, but um, I don't remember a lot from before I was five. And it's interesting you bring that up, Julie, with school. That was actually a, one of my first memories is like from kindergarten. Um, and, you know, the door, something about that space of going into that building, um, yes. and it was sort of a lower level um, of the building. It was also, in, it was a sort of church kindergarten. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's interesting to, to think about why those memories, why you're able to remember at that particular moment or, you know, from things before. And some of it is I, I question, do I remember this or was there a photograph? Because there's some things with that, I don't, there's not a photograph. So I think, okay, yes, I can trust that I remember that. But other memories where I'm like, maybe I remember that, but am I just remembering the story that's, you know, my mom told me or, right. um, and I'm remembering that particular photograph. So I, but I would, I think it's like sort of that five-year-old kindergarten going into mm -hmm. school. I read an odd study and I can't remember now. It's one of those terrible things where you want to find it again to be sure that you read it right. But I, I think I did. And it said that they had been doing research that children who have really early memories, like in the like two and three year old memories. Um, and I don't know if this how consistently this holds up, but that it tends to be um, children who like sleep a ton, like that something about that, like encodes those memories and that um, children who are like less sleep oriented that they tend to have later memories. Um, and I don't know if that rings true for you, but um, I was I was a big sleeper as a child, like really, like I think like 12 hours a night. And so I think I encoded everything, um, but I don't know. That was an interesting study. I wondered if that was why my memories felt so vivid so young. But, um, I don't think we've ever been asked that, or I haven't been asked that. So. Yeah, that's no, yeah. interesting. It's a good question. Um, I think, oh, Lori, Lori asked, can you give advice? Uh oh, it's going up the chat. Let me see if I can find it. Can you give advice, oh, as to where to submit hybrid writing? Um, most publications ask you to categorize, and hybrid is rarely one of the choices. Um, that's, that is true, though, I mean, I do think happily it's beginning to change, and one of the first places that changed that I noticed right away, um, my one of my alma maters, uh, Western Washington University, uh, publishes the Bellingham Review, and they added a hybrid um, line. So, you know, there's typically fiction and poetry and hopefully creative nonfiction, but they added a fourth category for hybrid. Um, and they also did that in tandem with um, adding a hybrid track to their MFA program, um, which I think is really lovely and progressive. Um, and of course, like publications like Diagram um, sort of welcome inherently hybrid work of all varieties, including like hybridities of word and image or, or word and like pictorial elements. Um, are, are there others that, that you can think of, Julia? Those just came to my mind. Mm, I think of like fourth genre, um, you know, is one that, you know, I think I remember I submitted an essay and they were like, oh, actually go more lyrical, like, um, you know, take out the, the narrative totally and it's pushing me towards going more lyrical. Um, you know, I think that you do kind of, 
I mean, I think as you say, Julie, I think more places are becoming open to like hybrid pieces, things that are more lyrical that are like, where do we categorize this? Um, and so I think part of it's just maybe taking a chance and just sending it to other places. I remember I, I was submitting actually the like titular essay for this book to creative nonfiction. And um, one of my professors was like, mm, I'm not quite sure like if that's gonna be a fit there. Um, and then it, it turned out they accepted it and it was, you know, it worked out, but they put it in the sort of, um, what was experimental section or something. Yeah. Um, and so I just think sometimes if, if, you know, the piece is working, just try, you know, try sending it to places they might be like, oh, that we don't normally publish pieces like this too, or, you know, this feels like a little bit more experimental for us, but they might, it might work there just, you know, with the other pieces they're publishing at that yeah. for that issue. That's true. And even some places where initially, you know, like 10 or 12 years ago, I would look and they didn't necessarily even have a category for creative nonfiction. Now I'm seeing even differentiation of um, like I know Gulf Coast uh, has um, like a category for creative nonfiction and then they have a separate category for lyric essay, mm -hmm. which I always kind of read to me. And like if you have something even more experimental or you're not sure where it fits, you can set it here. Um, and then now as I'm talking, I'm thinking of Fugue, um, how they have a whole, like a litany of submission options, including one called The Experiment. So anything that's like, ex that uses the word experiment or experimental always seems like, if you're not sure what to call this, or you think it might be more than one thing, you know, we're open to it. Um, and Black Warrior Review is like that too. There's just very, there's some places that are um, really open, like surprise us. Oh, oh and the journal Q, um, QU, um, and the journal Posit, I have found both of those to be very friendly to experimental work. So, um, good question. Uh, let me see, did I miss any other ones? I don't know, I haven't been great at monitoring. Oh, wait, re monitoring the chat. Um, Heather, oh, Heather, hi, Heather. Both of you really captured some of the feelings and textures of um, experiencing the body as much younger person. Are those leaps challenging? Is there something about lyric that facilitates it? Good question. What do you think? Um, I think this connects with what you're talking about, Julie, with the body, um, you know, thinking about the body. Um, and, um, you know, I do think it can be challenging to like, you know, I, I like the word, your word we're using there, um, Heather, like leaping. It does feel like a kind of like leaping, inhabiting, um, you know, part of yourself that feels in some ways distant um, and maybe even a separate kind of self in a way um, that like, okay, who I was at, at this particular moment. Um, and I do think that, as you say this, I think that the, the lyric d allows for these kinds of leaps, um, I, you know, in time and, and also to be thinking about um, you know, ourselves as sort of fragmented um, and these memories is fragmented. And so um, in a form that sort of, um, you know, is, is in, um, in embracing that kind of fragmentation, I, I think that um, to me, it works as a way of inhabiting these spaces um, from, from the past. Now, that's not to say, you know, things that are not like categorized as, as lyrical are not doing that. But um, I think for me that that's part of it that it, and I think it connects back with this earlier question about the connection between the um, poetry and the nonfiction um, yeah. that for me sort of zooming in sometimes on a particular word or something in the language is a way of um, allowing myself to figure out what was I thinking, what am I thinking about this, what sort of questions do I have about this particular moment and that's a way in of investigating those kinds of experiences about um, yeah, particularly I think from childhood and early adolescence, um, that that's a way of trying to, for myself to kind of work through those things. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, I don't know if this is true for you, Julia, but as I, like, I find this strange thing happens, like the older I get, the more clearly, actually maybe that's like a literal and a metaphorical, right? Like as you get older, like it's easier to see things that are further away than it is to see things that are up close. I feel like that's also true metaphorically, like the older I get, the more I can see kind of like the like the patterning or the it's like the lace work of the past, like things that at the time when you were living them or even a couple years out, I, I could write about them in a diary, but I didn't really have any perspective on how they might um, later come back and affect like the person I was becoming at a later time or how I might be able to see certain patterns with other things that like hadn't even happened yet, right? And so um, the thing that keeps happening to me is that as I'm getting older, I'm seeing the past 
more clearly and I'm able to make connections across um, all of you know my childhood and adolescence that I couldn't have done even when I was a younger writer, like in my 20s when I was just starting to probe um, the past and the past was so much closer then. Um, and so then this also raises the question as I get older, like if my 30s are just now sort of coming into view a little bit, like how old, like I'm going to be really old and still trying to understand my middle age. Like there's always that delay. Um, and I, I do think that the lyric helps because it allows you certain freedoms. Um, but at the same time, a really well chosen structure helps you from uh, keep from getting lost in it. So like if there's, I love in Julia's work, how there are those definitions um, like permeating the text and like a pattern of coming back to words. And that's a, that's a pattern I love um, to use myself but it's also a way of keeping myself grounded because there's so many so many things to potentially say um but i'm finding that the far away is getting clearer right now yeah i think that's a great point julia about like i think sometimes it can feel like oh you have all this sort of unlimited sort of space or you know and things where you're thinking about mm -hmm. lyric essay but i think that um you know sometimes that can actually be a disadvantage of thinking about, okay, I actually have to figure out, is it going to be a, some sort of formal choice or, yes. um, you know, what am I going to go back to that's actually going to feel like these, this uh, piece coheres and that it makes sense why I'm, I'm leaping from thing to thing, because, you know, I think you could do that kind of leaping and it doesn't make any sense, you know? Um, so I think that, um, I think that's a great point about n sort of being able to recognize where the patterns are. And I think sometimes you can't do that when you're right in the midst of it, you're like right there instead of seeing, yes. like, okay, pulling back and seeing where the, the moments are that are actually connected. This is also a great occasion um, for anyone who hasn't um, studied with us, or I, I guess maybe I'm assuming that you talk about um, hermit crab or adopted forms with your students also, but it's just so helpful sometimes to adopt a form um, that you know going in that you're going to use that structure. And by that, I usually mean um, like a, a form we don't associate with literature at all, but that you can impose. So I mean, whether it's recipes or answering machine messages or something that um, gives you a structure that you might discover what you want to say about a subject rather than going in knowing for sure what you do want to say. Um, so that's also been the gift of like the, the hermit crab subgenre of lyric essay for me has been just finding. Um, and in the last part of my book, whoa, microphone on the loose. Um, in the last part of my book, um, I use a geometric proof because I was really interested in the proofs that were inductive. Uh, they were the ones that looked like prose poems instead of the ones in the T-chart. Um, and so I thought maybe I can use that because that was the only part of geometry I was ever good at. And then it gave me a way to talk about things that I don't know that I would have talked about them like some of them i wouldn't have thought of without the form um, to elicit the content and also it was fun because i felt like i was winning on math you know in the end so is the hermit crab something that you teach also or something that you that you enjoy as a writer yeah i do i think um Eulabus is the pain scale like is one that that i've used multiple times talking about different forms um and you know yeah, I think that it's interesting, too, that you're talking about, you know, how does the form, if you decide on the form, there's all these questions, though, that you kind of spaces you can go and, and not know the answers to thing because you, you do have this one thing that's kind of shaping you. Um, I think this is true for like me with poetry. Sometimes like I'm like, I'm going to write this villanelle because yeah. I have these confines, like sort of like, here are the rules that I have to be following to a degree. Yes. Um, but then things, there's actually surprises that come out of that because yeah. I'm, you know, forcing myself to be working within these things. Like I come up with a word I, or an image, or like you said, you know, in working with mathematical proofs, you yes. automatically have this built-in kind of language that you might think about, oh, how, in thinking about this, you know, desire in connection with, you know, mathematics, right. like what, what happens there and things that you wouldn't expect. Um, yeah, I, I'm here for the surprises too. That's that's really exciting um, about the lyric essay is that you you might end up somewhere you never imagined or never predicted. It might you know elicit a memory that you thought you had forgotten or never thought to remember. Um, are there any other? Oh, there's one more question in the question box. We don't want to keep you obviously too long, but we want to answer them. Um, this question. Oh, this question's from Vaughn. Hi, Vaughn. When you're writing more quote, experimental or hybrid works, how much do you have a sense in advance what form it will take and how much do you find the form along the way? Um, good follow up. Yeah, so I have, I can talk about this a little bit. It, the first um, essay in the rib joint is called um, Astronomy of the Closet, uh, Seven Axioms. 
and actually came to the forum like pretty late in, in working on this essay. Um, as I was writing it, like I was thinking about like queerness and um, thinking about theory. And then I, I had like thinking about the Eve Cedric um, epistemology of the closet, but I yeah. didn't think like, oh, maybe a way of framing this is to actually have, you know, a, like axioms that I create that are, you know, speaking to like Eve Cedric and thinking about, um, you know, what happens when we, when we try to like create this thing to say like, oh, this is true. Um, you know, and, and trying to prove that, that that's true. Um, and it kind of gave, it gave me a way of like refiguring the, the structure of the essay. So that actually came pretty late um, for me. I had written a lot of the essay before and then it was mainly I shifted things around. So it was changing the order, changing where maybe I had one piece was actually it makes more sense to move this up here if I'm, you know, writing this in this form. Um, so I think it's, it depends on the essay, but for that one, it came pretty late. It wasn't like, oh, here's the form that the form actually came about as I was writing it and thinking about, oh, this is actually an interesting connection here. I love that essay. I um, Now I need to reread that essay again, because of course it's the first um, piece of your prose that I read and, and it stayed with me. Um, the, the thing about structure for me is that I usually decide um, kind of in a Virgo way. Like I, I like to plan, I like to plan my surprises. I like to plan, like create a space for my surprises to happen. Um, so usually what I think of when I'm writing an essay, if it's not overtly like a hermit crab where I've already chosen a shell to work within, um, I usually just like to think of it as like, when I'm writing, I keep rereading it out loud, even if I've only added maybe a paragraph or a few sentences. And I keep looking for like, what's the thing that I can pull through? And though I'm, not a seamstress in any way and don't work with real thread. There feels like this thing, this thread that I have to keep pulling through and pulling through all the way through. Um, and so I don't wanna miss any opportunities. So maybe I'll take a really long time on what becomes just the first page of the essay because it feels like maybe everything that I put down there um, is a clue to what, like it might be introducing something like teeth and I didn't realize how much I had to say about teeth, but if I keep going back and pulling that thread through, I can keep finding um, the sort of the, um, arms of the essay like I can build the rest of the body of the essay from what's at the beginning um and so I try to always go back and mine it and it doesn't mean that I'm locked in forever but usually if I get that first page or those first few paragraphs right I've given myself kind of a, a structural map of where where I can go next um or I can pick something that I know I want to repeat so like in the essay that you read right there's there's the pattern of definition and tracing where the words come from and what their literal meanings are um and in mine I had the switch to second person which is italicized to have like the reflective other voice come in and speak to the first person self um I sometimes just pick something like that as a like a guardrail so that I, I don't lose myself in the in the essay. I don't know. I love, you, go ahead. I was just gonna say I love too how you come back at the end of the essay and just circling back to that like distinction. We're talking about secrets and mystery um, yes. and the teeth coming in there. And so then I think um, you know when you hear it your mind kind of takes you back to the echo like when you heard it earlier in the essay and so then you're kind of Okay, hey, what, what were you talking about earlier? And then how have you, how has that changed now that we're somewhere else in the essay? Oh, I like that word echo too. I think lyric essays have a lot of echoes. Like they have fragments and they have recursions, but those echoes like where it's just a part of something. Like I, I love that echo chamber um, effect. Um, I don't know if we, if did we miss anyone's question? I feel guilty. This happens to me in class too. I miss things in the chat. Yeah. Like when we down. Um, but uh, I think maybe we answered all your questions. Um, if, if we didn't, uh, this is the moment. But um, I, I think we're both really grateful that uh, you were here. And um, thank you um, for tuning in and for staying with us for so long since we've been planning this and telling people about it for a whole year. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining. We really appreciate it. And someday we'll probably get a chance to read in person together in Florida somewhere. I think it'll happen. Yeah, so it'll definitely happen. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you for making this possible. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Books and Books. Thank you so much. All right, I guess I guess we just like, Books and Books says thank you. I guess we just click out. I'll, we'll see you all soon. Um, bye, Julia. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.